Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Yoon Ha, and uh, I'm going to represent my uh, partner in crime who cannot be here, unfortunately. Peter, uh, actually, he's my supervisor, Peter Chow White. Um, so this is actually my master's thesis uh, I presented last April. Um, I, it took about 30 minutes. Uh, I, I originally just have 20, uh, but my... Uh, my um, chair let it slide so I tried to condense it within 15 minutes this time so many of you here probably wondering like what is the connection between communication and genomics so my job here is today is to kind of bring to light how genomic is actually a form of information communication technologies or arguably a form of big data um, so yeah, the title, I kind of change it a little bit. Um, is the role communication in knowledge production of clinical genomics, a survey examining genomic literacy among medical oncologists in British Columbia. Oh, I'm based in Vancouver. Um, so the outline is, um, uh, first I'm going to discuss the conceptual framework that I use for this for my thesis, which is the spaces of convergence. Then I discuss uh, briefly the methodology to that um, um, that I, I conducted, and then I'm going to discuss the three main findings. The first one is the educational role of personalized oncogenomic, which is a cancer clinical trial based in Vancouver, and then uh, the relationship between genomic and genomic uh, geography and genomic literacy, and the last one uh, will be general level of genomic literacy among oncologists. Actually, I'm going to flip that. I will present my uh, last data uh, second and then my uh, geography and genomic literacy uh, last. And then I'll argue what is the implication of this fighting for communication scholarship and what is at stake for clinical genomic doctor and patients. So um, for my conceptual framework, I draw upon the concept of spaces of conversion developed by uh, Chao Wai and Gassia Central. Uh, they define that space of conversions as uh, the spaces of flow between people, capital, disciplinary expertise, information, ethics, computing, algorithm, and technology. So you see this is a space of conversion between human and non-human actors. And in this space, um, these uh, these uh, actors here represent nodes embedded with discourses, values, and social and human relations. So we argue that this space uh, represent a space of mediation to mediate the relationship between these nodes. And um, so it, can, it in a way it represents a technological mediated process of communication. So the end products of this basis of convergence is the central node right here, and it represents um, materials or databases, or in this case we call big data. So this, my pres uh, in this present, um, this my thesis. Uh, so it's captured the spaces of flow between people and technology, um, in in the case of cancer clinical genomics. So next, I'm going to present to you my, uh, my site of research, which, which is a cancer clinical genomic trial based in Vancouver named uh, personal, Personalized Encore Genomics, or the short form is PARC. So uh, I use the same model for my conceptual framework to apply here. So at PARC, you see um, is it, it represents um, the people, actually, I separated it into two group, uh, two, uh, stake, two stakeholders, which is data scientists or bioinformaticians and physician, which is medical oncologists. And their disciplinary expertise, along with um, genomic information, medical ethics, computing algorithm, to, uh, that represent um, how uh, data scientists uh, analyze uh, genomic data sequencing and genomic technology, more in particular um, genomic data sequencing, uh, R R RNA and DNA sequencing, and funding, of course, from either from the government or from donors. Uh, and um, so PARC is a very special case because they only enroll uh, incurable cancer patients that has no standardized treatment or very limited treatment options. And um, 
is different from other genomic testing and profiling centers in U.S. especially, where tests are simply being ordered by oncologists and they receive the report that they have to analyze or decipher the data, the meaning of the genomic data by themselves. At PARC, uh, it's, it goes through a whole pipeline and uh, every Thursday, uh, every Thursday, all the stakeholders at PARC gather together in a room like this and they discuss each individual patient cases. And uh, so, at, so uh, first oncologists, for example, in one meeting, oncologists come up to discuss a patient cancer patient case. And after that, a pathologist would come up to, uh, and to present the tumor uh, sequencing, tumor analysis of the cancer. Of the cancer, and then a uh, bioinformatician uh, will come up to present the uh, genomic pathway of the bioinformatic uh, uh, anal analysis. So, and then the meeting, um, and after all the presentation, the meeting will. Um, everyone would kind of uh, have like an informal discussion to decide the meaning of the genomic information, whether it's clinically actionable or not, so whether they can find any effective treatment that target the biomarker of the tumor. I know I'm using quite a few uh, ter medical terminology here. Um, so this bidirectional conversion so at PARC, it represents a bi-directional conversion between medical sciences and computing sciences and between data scientists and practitioners that exemplify um, a new style of medical practice that generate novel and distinctive ways of producing medical data for cancer treatments. So this is my conceptual framework and my site research. And in the following uh, are my three research questions. So the first one is, what is the value of PARC? Or what is the value of this cancer clinical trial? And the second is, what is the level of genomic literacy among colleges in British Columbia? With this question is, with genomic data, se genomic sequencing, it generates a huge amount of medical data. And people would think that it's great. The more data you have, the more resources doctor could have to treat your cancer. But actually, uh, doctors are not trained in reading genomic information. So what is their genomic knowledge that could handle that uh, massive amount of data? And then um, the last one would tie into the title out of my presentation, what are the role of communication in spaces of conversion in cancer in clinical genomics big data? So um, before we dive into this research question, I'd like to kind of give a brief uh, uh, discussion of genomic literacy. So what does it mean to be genomically literate? In, um, it, here, the definition of genomic literacy reflects a set of perspective and a repertoire of competency to understand how people or different medical stakeholders encode and decode genomic information. I draw on this concept based on Stuart Hall encoding and decoding model as well as media literacy by Stu um, James Porter. Um, so it also explores the social relation between medical stakeholders in the meaning-making process of genomic information. So overall, this concept, this definition here of genomic literacy, represent a form of knowledge, genomic knowledge, and also a way of understanding how the knowledge is produced through the social relation and communicative and discussive processes. And I'll, uh, for the interest of time, I'll just kind of skip through this um, research design method. So basically, in this to, for this my for my master thesis, I conducted a systematic review, a semi-structure, uh, semi five semi-structured interview with oncology genome scientists and bioinformaticians, and I did a pilot survey before actually launching a final survey. So I'll skip. Okay, yeah, that's good. So um, the first finding, the first finding is the pedagogical role of Paul. So when. Um, uh, when we asked one of the survey questions, we asked oncologists why they why why did they want to collaborate with PARC, and we thought that majority of them would would mainly majority or all of them would want to collaborate with PARC to find effective treatment. So you can see here, 94% of oncologists 
like wanted to collaborate with Park to five factor treatment, but it's only 94. Where does the six percent go? So we found that six percent of colleges wanted to collaborate with Park in order to learn more about genomic research. So they only want to learn more about genomic research. Oh, that's the six percent uh, here, which is individual data. Um, and in the open-ended uh, survey question, uh, we asked them what they find most value, valuable about Paul. A lot of them say it's educational for me, help me navigate the mystified genomics, uh, it gives great hope to doctors and patients, or it's very educational due to their multidisciplinary team discussions, which happen every Thursday, and or interaction with colleagues in discussing genomic and potential implications for therapies are the main value, one of the main value they find about PARC. So um, this represents that PARC, um, this represents that PARC is not just a cancer clinical trial, it represents like a larger process of social interaction, discussion, and communication between different medical stakeholders at the weekly meeting that actually help produce genomic literacy and help produce the meaning of genomic data. The next question, research question is, we found is that majority of, of oncologists in British Columbia have low level gene genomic literacy. So when we ask what is the level of basic genetic principle, majority, well, mo a little bit more than half, 62% said that they are sub very knowledgeable. No, somewhat knowledgeable. Only about 40% said very knowledgeable. When it comes to uh, like newer gene genomic technology, that number decreased is that only 90% of them say they're somewhat knowledgeable and only 10% say they're very knowledgeable. So these are medical oncologists who are going to make life treatment decisions for patients. You want them to be either at least very knowledgeable or expert, but here the number is not very, the data can show that it's not very high. And the last and the last and most important piece of information we found is that oncologists who locate near, like in Metro Vancouver uh, have higher genomic literacy uh, than oncologists who locate outside Metro Vancouver. So this show. This, the findings show that reflect a Castellan concept of network society and innovative milieu. So sociologists have found that in the age of globalization, geography matters because the central hub in innovation can attract capital, expert, and infrastructures for the development and diffusion of innovation. So park proximity to metropolitan like Vancouver can have an impact on the level of genomic literacy, possibly due to easier access to more genomic training, workshop, conferences, or other face-to-face -face community uh, opportunities. So what does it mean for communication? What these finding or research mean for communication scholarship? <clears throat> so we found that um, using the concept of genomic literacy, um, we found that uh, communication plays a significant role in shaping the pedagogical role of PARC. And this value of PARC can improve genome literacy among physicians. And higher genome literacy can influence decision-making process uh, of treatments. And as genomic carries significant values to our vitality and subjectivity, the meaning making of genomic uh, information can have a direct impact on our health, vitality, and identity. So the question is who will be part of the communication um, discourse and dialogue that will shape and guide knowledge production of clinical genomics can offer a critical understanding of the role communication in the shaping of technology, knowledge, and power. And what does what is at stake for clinical genomic doctor and patient? So, one thing you need um, that I sh should remind you guys is that these patients that enroll in PARC, they has incurable cancer, which means they have no standardized treatment or very limited treatment. So, PARC is their last hope or their last resort. So, um, PARC carry a sense of hope for patient and doctors, and they play a critical role in the adoption of genomic technologies. So um, the higher level of genomic literacy can have, um, can, uh, can give 
can give higher genome literacy, can give them a better chance of a better chance of receiving a treat, effective treatment. Um, so genomic literacy can influence the cru crucial diffusion of genomic into clinical care, um, and low level of genomic literacy can result in low uptake of clinical genomics. And um, again, I just want to stress out is that Paul carry a sense of hope for biomedical innovation in clinical genomics. Uh, last, the last few slides. Just want to thank. Uh, PCCA and Genome BC for funding this research. Uh, there's a few publications coming out of this research. We actually just got uh, pop, well, accepted for a journal um, earlier this week. And I uh, just want to say a thank to a few people in my lab who contributed to this project. Uh, thank you very much. Imagine waking up in the morning, and along with the day's weather and breaking news, you get an update about your risk of contracting a contagious disease. It warns you about which illnesses are prevalent in your neighborhood, just as a weather forecast might tell you it's warm and sunny with a chance of showers. A live map warns you when you're under a zone of contagion, or when a sick person draws near. A numerical score corresponds to your calculated risk of becoming diseased. This is not a vision of the future, it's today's technology. The app and website SickWeather, a so-called Facebook for hypochondriacs, collects information from social media and across the web, as well as self-reports from users, so that people can see who is sick in their neighborhood. In 2011, uh, the site reportedly detected an outbreak of whooping cough nearly two weeks before public health officials. On its website, SickWeather describes how it draws on publicly available social media information with location data, tweets like, I'm sick, or my son has chicken pox, and allows members to make direct illness reports. The website also describes how the information gathering is selective, apparently capable of distinguishing between posts like, I'm running a fever, and this is their example, OMG, I love Justin Bieber, Bieber fever forever. <laughs> a future version of the app will even allow users to see which of their friends are talking about being sick on social media. Surprisingly, few privacy concerns have been raised about this. So here are some screenshots uh, from the app using, uh, using my phone. Um, so on the left there, you can just see the notification that pops up if you uh, are near a reported illness. Uh, it's obviously using the location data from your own phone as well. And then when you click on that, you get this map here showing you your location, the illness report. Uh, and then if you uh, click on that, it gives you further information about whatever the particular illness is, whether it's a fever, uh, flu, or something like that. Within the app, you can also see this radar view that supposedly shows you the spread of disease as if you're watching a weather report. Um, so there you see it shows uh, where disease was supposedly spreading across the map five days ago, and then four days ago, and then it keeps going until the present day and just shows this sort of almost like a, uh, like a weather pattern moving across. So the work that I'll be talking about today explores these digital disease tracking tools, particularly those that employ so-called big data approaches to tracking and predicting the spread of disease. Both private companies and government agencies increasingly draw on informal data streams to complement traditional public health methods for tracking contagious diseases, uh, using data mining and analytics to predict and monitor outbreaks. However, there's little oversight or regulation surrounding the collection, storage, transmission, and ownership of this information. I'm looking at three platforms in particular, Google Flu Trends, as well as Health Map and Sick Weather, uh, which both have a mobile app and website. I'm focused on the following research questions. What are the privacy and surveillance implications of using these kinds of big data disease tracking tools? And then secondly, how do represent, uh, representations of disease through these apps discursively construct uh, threat uh, and risk? Uh, originally, I was going to try to cover both of these in this presentation, but in the interest of not going way over my time uh, and making everyone hate me for talking way too long, I'll just focus on the first one. Uh, so moving on to Google flu trends, back in 2008, researchers from Google claimed that they could now cast the flu, forecasting the disease the same way weather is monitored, based solely on people's searches. Uh, basically, when people are sick, many of them search for flu-related information, uh, which can then supposedly be used as a kind of proxy for the overall spread of the disease. Uh, when combined with information from the CDC, accurate estimates could be provided up to two weeks earlier than CDC data alone. Yet by 2013, Google flu trends, uh, as many media outlets reported, failed spectacularly, overpredicting the prevalence of the flu by more than 50%. Google's algorithm didn't properly account for changes in search behavior over time. Uh, the way that people search for information and used Google changed over the years, but Google flu trends didn't really stay on top of this. 
An early warning sign appeared in 2011 when flu trends data was notably skewed. The culprit, pop singer Rihanna, who tweeted about having the flu, leading to a spike in search queries from fans who were presumably curious about the celebrity's health. Uh, the underlying assumption of flu trends was that one can use online behavior as an indicator of infection status, yet as Rihanna's concerned, fans demonstrated that's not always the case. When I talk about this, I like to say that Rihanna proved Google flu trends doesn't work, work, work. <laughs> Uh, here's HealthMap, uh, an app and website created by researchers at Boston's Children's Hospital. It collects and analyzes information from a variety of platforms, uh, including social media, online news, and travel sites, uh, to provide early detection and surveillance of disease outbreaks. It made headlines in 2014 for detecting references to Ebola infections from local newspapers in Guinea. In contrast to HealthMap uh, or Google Flu Trends, turning back to sick weather, um, this app doesn't involve collaboration with public health organizations such as the CDC, uh, so it's not a public health tool, but it's instead geared towards individual and con uh, commercial use. It uses advertising as well as a paid pro version to generate revenue, targeting individual consumers, and as described on its website, clients that include some of the biggest names in pharmaceuticals, insurance, retail, household hygiene. Last year, SickWeather uh, introduced SickWeather Pro, paid licenses to the software that are available for $800 per month for non-commercial use and $1,200 per month for commercial use. Corporations and advertisers are encouraged to use publishing tools to reach the SickWeather community, uh, which you can see on the left there. Uh, and then within the app, users are encouraged to share SickWeather, promoting the app through Facebook or other means to help keep your friends and family safe, as seen in the screenshot on the right. Disease tracking and sick weather is given an urgent quality, designed to update users in a way that mimics social media feeds. Updates, notifications, and forecasts are displayed within the app, and users are prompted to receive alerts outside of the app. So again, we just see another alert on the left there. Um, uh, users are also able to post messages and updates that are tied to specific locations, such as schools or restaurants that are visible to other users, uh, as seen on the screenshot to the right here. Uh, HealthMap, by contrast, is positioned not as a commercial product, but as an actual public health tool designed to deliver information to libraries, local health departments, governments, as well as individual users. Uh, on the website, the information sources and services are listed and made freely available. The app doesn't gather information about users, build advertising profiles, uh, or try to mimic social media feeds. There are no alerts that notify users of outbreaks uh, when they're not using the app. User submissions are reports rather than uh, status updates. Here's a window that you can open up in HealthMap, updating users with recent cases uh, or outbreaks of diseases. If you click on one of these alerts up here, you would then be brought to a screen like this down here, um, where you can see more information about that particular outbreak. And then here we see a graph that you can uh, see within the health, uh, the health map app or website that shows the prevalence of the flu over the course of 12 months in several different locations. Uh, and then here's a list of outbreaks in your current location, categorized into vector-borne alerts, respiratory alerts, and so on. Uh, the Office of the Privacy, Com Privacy Commissioner of Canada has outlined privacy rights of app users uh, about how developers are responsible for the information they collect, use, and disclose. Federally, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act dictates how information about individuals may be collected, used, or disclosed by organizations undertaking commercial activities. However, despite the existence of these laws and regulations, in practice, there are many barriers to effectively uh, pr protecting users' data. This is particularly concerning uh, due to the broad nature of the data being collected, as these apps are not only recording symptoms and other health information, but combine it with location tracking, social interactions, and more. Further, this information, once collected and stored, is often accessible to third parties, hackers, or other groups that the user may not be aware of due to the information being sold or breached. The nonprofit group Privacy Rights Clearinghouse examined 43 popular health and fitness mobile apps and found that 72% posed a medium to high risk regarding personal privacy. In a similar report, the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Alberta evaluated around 1,200 apps and contended that almost one-third required access to personal information beyond the scope of their purpose. More than a quarter of the apps uh, found, uh, that were evaluated were found to have either no privacy policy at all or one that uh, raised serious concerns regarding how the information would be collected, used, uh, and disclosed. 
Ontario's Personal Health Information Act outlines how health information custodians are required to take, uh, in quotes, reasonable steps to protect users' information from threats such as unauthorized use, unauthorized use, copying, modification, or disposal. However, the wording is very general and does not specify any sort of physical or electronic safeguards that must be put into place. Uh, it's also important to note that many apps, including SickWeather, uh, are designed outside of Canada, or at least use cloud-based storage outside of the country, and US-based apps and services are unlikely to comply with multiple sets of laws beyond their borders. The SickWeather uh, privacy policy seen here uh, is available on the app's website and can be navigated to within the app. Um, it's the ridiculously tiny print down here, privacy policy. It's almost like they don't want you to navigate to it. Uh, in addition to logging users' IP address, geographic and device information, SickWeather maintains the right to store and transmit this information to third parties. Advertising partners may also deliver ads to users' web browsers when visiting other sites or applications. This involves collecting data that's not only submitted to the app voluntarily, but using information collected about users from elsewhere on the web. The privacy statement describes how users' information may be shared with third parties for advertising purposes, but that SickWeather also reserves the right to use the data, quote, for any purpose that they may deem desirable. Despite assuring users throughout the privacy statement that personal information is anonymized, it also states that identifying information may be revealed to advertisers or other third parties, and that the developers uh, don't have any liability for any breach of the systems or uh, interception of data transmission. Health map, uh, does not have a privacy policy. However, there's a terms of use on its website where it's stated that collected uh, personal information includes users' email addresses and IP addresses, and that the researchers reserve the right to use this information internally, including but not limited to research purposes, quality assurance, and correspondence with the users. It's assured that researchers will not sell, share, rent, or otherwise reveal this information to any third party, except as required by law or to address issues of non-compliance. I locate these apps and ideas of network power and control societies. The purpose of control here is to gather and manage information. Symptom tracking tools such as SickWeather or HealthMap position individuals to be what uh, Hamilton and Gerlach call diseasable subjects, information that uh, must be monitored and recorded. Users actively contribute information about themselves and others. This is what Andrejevic calls lateral surveillance, d uh, distinct from forms of top-down monitoring, as it's a form of peer-to-peer -peer surveillance that's thinly disguised as data sharing and participation in the network society. With sick weather, users are encouraged to be good citizens by providing information. Digital disease tracking tools are often framed in this language of citizenship, as people are uh, compelled by this looming specter of risk. Uh, in sick weather, this is represented by the ever-present notifications. Uh, yet as we see with sick weather, this information is arguably gathered not primarily for public health purposes, but to make the network more valuable for the owners, for advertising, and for other revenue streams that rely on the aggregation of fragmented data streams. Levina suggests that this is a move towards control and that the ever-increasing use of network technologies in our lives allows for the pervasive surveillance of mobile populations, aggregating increasingly fragmented data. The point here is not to vilify disease-tracking apps or corporations such as Google. As Moscow contends, so-called big data constitute a broad range of ideas, practices, and techniques occurring in a variety of contexts. Rather, the point here is to examine how big data approaches to tracking disease are a particular kind of activity system that might be embedded with certain power relations, uh, boundaries, and divisions of labor. Connecting this to concepts like network power, the control society, and surveillance assemblage can help reveal the implications of these tools, however well-meaning they are, for individual privacy. Thank you. And thank you for this. This paper springs from postdoctoral research that I'm doing at the, um, the University of Copenhagen and also at Cora. It's a large re research. It's part of a large research project that is funded by the European Research uh, Council and led by Professor Klaus Heuer, who also co-authored this paper. Klaus is not able to be here today, so I will lead you through. With this paper, we'd like to address concerns about the sustainability of digital infrastructures. We argue that a much celebrated virtue in digital development, namely seamlessness, also constitutes a potential source of social instability. For years, the attempts to create legitimacy, legitimacy around digital solutions it has focused on ensuring that they are helpful and easy to use, but in an era where digital solutions tend to be integrated still more seamlessly and still more of our activities, the easiness, we think, constitutes a matter of concern to which we as scholars should direct more attention. 
So this is where I seek to lead you. But let me start by taking you back to the summer of 2014, because at this time, a big scandal about the sourcing of health data developed in Denmark. Do you have trouble getting an erection? Do you worry about your looks? Or do you have problems with your friends or your finances? General practitioners have been entering this kind of information into a national database for years without prior permission from the patients. This was announced in the Danish news media in the late summer of 2014. And all this fuss was about a particular technology for the collection, storage and then exchange of health data, namely the Danish General Practice Database, or simply DAMT, stands there in the middle. Mm, damned. <laughs> DAM was developed about 10 years earlier by a group of pioneering GPs who had led the way in digitalizing the medical record. Having established a nationwide infrastructure that enabled automatic data transfer uh, from medical records with fast and tailored feedback to the GPs, these developers had mastered what has long been seen as the main challenge in the digital development namely to create a good fit between user and technology to allow for efficient and seamless work experiences. And the system was celebrated. A healthcare official, for instance, spoke of it as about the best thing happening in the Danish healthcare services for years. And even the people who became fierce opponents of this system also looked back upon it as being a helpful tool because it provided a fantastic overview for GPs. But in 2014, DAM became the center of a major public, uh, public controversy. The legitimacy of transferring intimate uh, information about patient treatment to third parties became contested. And after intense debate in the highest political circles, data flows were suspended and the database was officially abolished. So how did this celebrated technology turn into an object of contestation? This is what we seek to understand. How do we go about it? Analytically, we combined STS studies of infrastructure and the recent stream of valuation studies that draw upon American pragmatism, particularly due to theory of valuation. And this invites us to understand infrastructures not just as material constructs, but also as forms of practice co-produced by human and non-human actors. So infrastructures are built, rebuilt, and function in certain ways, depending on who is involved, at which, which times, and in which ways. And also, um, the build-up and breakdown of infrastructures cannot be fully understood without attention to the evaluations involved, we claim, because infrastructures matter. They matter for those concerned, and they may constitute matters of concern. So to understand what causes the breakdown of an infrastructure, it's also important to see what's actually at stake for the actors. Methodologically, we um, built upon a case study of the Danish case I just introduced to you. We did a historical tracking of it through publicly available documents and interviewed key actors, including developers and op opponents of the system and leaders of GP organization and public health authorities. But before I move to the analysis, I believe maybe a little bit of Danish context may be helpful. So this is where we are located in the world. It's a small and relatively welfare, wealthy welfare state with, uh, with 5.6 million inhabitants. There's a national healthcare system, it's tax funded and all citizens are covered. There are five regional uh, authorities that are responsible for organizing the delivery of healthcare services. In the system, GPs function as gatekeepers. They are self-employed, but they receive almost all the income from public funds. And also, there's a long tradition in Denmark for centralized data registration of citizens, dating back to the be beginning of the 20th century. And since 1968, a centralized person register has provided each citizen with a personal identification number. And this number is used in practically all interaction with the public uh, services and also with many private services. And it makes it possible to follow each individual throughout their lifespan and also between generations. So state controlled data collection is probably would be contested in many other contexts. But in Denmark, it's rarely questioned probably because citizens tend to have quite high level of trust in state institutions. In this, case, in this context, the present case is rather groundbreaking because it caused expression of distrust in the public administration of health data. This was not what the developers envisioned. 
Rather, they, uh, they saw their effort as being part of making general practice a modern and future-oriented place of chronic care. When they started to build what they came to see as a system of data-driven quality improvement. This effort required many things, among others the standardization um, of data collection through the development of a coding system that, that allowed the developers to pull data from the medical records and combine it with data from other sources. But for the system to be functional on a bigger scale and fit the busy everyday work life of GPs, it needed to be easier to use. So developers, they joined force with IBM to create a software that automated the data uh, transfer. So now data could be copied from the medical record to the central database without disturbing the, the physician, as one of the developers phrased it. And also an organizational development took place. The G a GP uh, organization and the regional authorities, they co-funded a GP quality unit, as it was called. And this unit, it would undertake the data cleaning and the processing on behalf of the GPs. So important part of the articulation work uh, needed to keep standardized processes on track, to use Strauss's word, was centralized. All this allows for efficient and seamless data flows, all with the aim of providing better care for more patients. At this point in the development, data was imagined circulating in a closed loop. GPs were seen as both the data producers and the users. But once the standards and the means for easy data exchange were in place, the infrastructure offered itself for new forms of use. From around 2010, researchers started to apply for access and data were increasingly used as a resource for research. And the regional authorities that co-funded the activities, they also wanted to benefit. As a result of a collective agreement made between the GPO organization and the authorities in 2010, the infrastructure changed markedly. It became mandatory for the GPs to install the software that enabled automatic data transfer and code the patient contacts. And it was also decided that um, data had to be transferred from the DAMP database to national clinical databases that were administered by the regional healthcare authority. And this allowed the authorities to pursue an ambition of cross-sectoral quality monitoring by linking data from general practice with uh, data from the hospitals. And also, um, the GPs were now required to transfer patient data to a public web portal called Health the D DK Sundhed Deco over there. Um, so now other healthcare professionals and patients, they could access the information from the medical records online with a login and patient consent. So now purposes of patient empowerment and better coordination of care were also inscribed in the infrastructure. Previously, the GPs had had the choice to transfer only some data to dump. But uh, now this opportunity disappeared because the GPs were required to copy all data into the public web portal. So a material transformation took place because the software was then adapted to let all the data except for case note being, being transferred automatically from the medical records to the database. And also the regional authorities, there is a possibility for the use of dump data for audit and planning purposes. So the system that was designed to allow GPs to identify no compliant patients was certainly uh, turned around and became seen as a resource for monitoring also the performance of the GPs. According to the informants, um, the, the authorities, they never received the data from a quality unit uh, and therefore I made this dotted line. But pressure for data access, it also came from national level authorities. The State Serum Institute in Denmark, um, it demanded a copy of all dump data in 2013 in an effort to centralize the administration of all health data in Denmark. This request was also rejected by the GP quality unit. A former director of the unit explained that he, they expected the data to be used for government consultancy purposes and also there were much political talk about pay for, uh, pay for performance and the use of health data as a motor of economic growth by allowing private companies uh, easier data access. And according to the director, this made them nervous for how these data would be used. These changes, they happen gradually and without individual GPs necessarily realizing the change. 
actually, it, it also often came as a surprise, even to those we interviewed, how many data flows that were enabled when we asked them uh, to draw this system together with us. And this taught us that the build-up of an efficient and smoothly function functioning infra infrastructure, it allowed data to travel and be used in new ways, but without any one of those being involved, necessarily being able to take a comprehensive view of it all. When it's often proposed that it's the failure to enroll actors that threatens the sustainability of infrastructures, here we see the reverse, because this expansion involved a considerable potential for conflict. And a particularly loud voice in what came to be a rather heated debate about this database. It was a small fraction of GPs for whom the issue of data became a route to political engagement. And one of the, G the GPs that came to lead the opposition explained, for 10 years I've quietly looked after my business. I've been a good doctor, coded everything and all of this until I suddenly realized this, this invasion of the professional authority or whatever you will call it. First, I think it's important to note her experience of surprise when she suddenly realized that she had uh, provided data for many more purposes than what she thought she'd signed up for. She even compared it to a wide open back door uh, to the consultation room where she had imagined confidential conversations taking place. Also, when the GP referred to the invasion of the professional authority, she referred to a political process that started with the negotiation of the collective agreement for the GPs in 2013 and then eventually to conflict. And in this conflict, data meant a lot. While the healthcare authorities saw the use of health data for control purposes as a legitimate way to ensure efficient spending of public resources, the GPs they saw it as an unacceptable threat to GP autonomy. So conflicting valuations were enacted. And following this conflict, the GP started to scrutinize the data transfers, as one of them explains here, and they did not like what they found. So they also started to scrutinize the legal database for the activities, and it was highly unclear. I will not have time to go into detail about this now, but we can talk about it later. But the GPs, they sought to voice concern over what they saw as illegitimate and illegal data activity but they felt unheard by the political representatives. And this fueled an ongoing power struggle among the GPs. And also now the national government intervened in the conflict between the GPs and the regional authorities and forced the GPs to code and report data through legislation. And now the good doctors turned activists. They reported the GP quality unit to the police for legal data activity. They used so social media in the fight against the database. And they made it a Facebook event when they deinstalled the software that allowed for the automatic data transfer and thereby they violated the law. And soon this case uh, found its way to the media and the citizens started to demand the data withdrawn. Uh, an investigation was uh, set in motion to explore the legal basis and the data flows were suspended. And today, three years later, the parties still negotiate to find a way forward. So where does this lead us? And now I will wrap up. For long, the construction of seamlessness, it has been at the center of digital development, also beyond healthcare. Look, for instance, to Google and Facebook and their huge efforts to create uh, good fits between users and technologies. Um, and these efforts are enabled through still more data accumulation. But the seamlessness, we think, may also constitute a, uh, source of social instability. In the Danish case, the ease of data access, it made it possible for the infrastructure to accum accommodate still more actors uh, that value data for still more purposes, but without the GPs realizing it, until it broke into conflict and the, it collapsed. So while seamlessness may be the solution of yesterday to problems of usability, it may also be a source of new problems because it allows for data reuse without exploring the valuations involved. So this may be the time to start thinking about how we may reinstall some friction in digital development, not necessarily in terms of hassles in the daily work practices as the notion of uh, ethical <coughs> notions of science friction would entail, but friction more as a productive resistance that can slow down motion and create heat, but also be an essential part of movement more like um, scholars like Anand Singh and David Stark would use the term. So provide for, to provide for sustainability, we've called for political mechanisms that may slow down the pace of development, 
and provide time for exploring and addressing the concerns that arise in tandem with the new possibilities. And for us as scholars, we think that we see a task in exploring further what the easiness produces in our relationship with digital infrastructures. So thank you for your attention. And the kicker is, I will diagnose you even though I'm not a doctor. Um, so um, this whole talk, my slides are on my slide share. So if you look at my Twitter feed and scroll past all of the other data health uh, session tweets, you'll find a link to slide share on my slides. So what I want to talk about today is a reflection on my own practice. I work in e-health at the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh, but I'm also part of the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science, newly formed in London. The talk is structured as follows. First of all, I'll give you a bit more of the background, what the question is. Then I'll look at some useful concepts from evidence-based medicine. And we'll also look at two case studies. One is the cost of the true positive, which is the cost of a disease being diagnosed correctly, and the second case study is the cost of the false positive, which is a warning that somebody may have a disease which turns out to be false, and both come with a cost. So I work a lot in e-health and telehealth. I have a background in linguistics, but uh, what I do is I work in a lot of projects where uh, we look at helping people monitor themselves, helping people take charge of their own health, but also delivering data about how people are doing, whether they're likely to relapse, whether they're likely to develop certain conditions such as dementia to clinicians. So that leads me to question, what am I doing? Right? So what am I doing when I'm working on these projects? when I'm analyzing people, people's data, when I'm giving that to clinicians, what does it mean? So the idea that's perpetuated in many of the technology conferences that I attend and that I also see time and time again in my colleagues is satirically speaking, you know, subjective data is, is messy, right? When people tell you, oh, I feel bad, are they really feeling bad? I mean, can you trust a person when they tell you they're feeling bad? Nah. So what would be great is if we could base diagnosis and all that messy health, especially mental health. Mental health is so messy. We want objectivity. <coughs> we want observable markers. So levels of activity. We want biomarkers. And then, once we've got that information, we deliver it. Um, maybe there's no need for doctors anymore. Yay! Go us! And this is getting funded. The European Union funds this stuff. It's part of the government discourse. It's really part of cost, cost effectiveness and efficiency drives. Because we don't have to pay humans anymore if the machines can do this. Again, this is a satire. In practice, humans are still very much needed. But this is roughly the discourse that we're up against. And what I'd like to do is I'll challenge that, first of all, from the point of view of evidence-based medicine, and secondly, from the point of view of the sociology of health and illness. I know that among the audience, there'll be many other viewpoints, and I'd love to hear from you, but these are the two starting points that I have. So tests for diagnosis are always messy. And that's what I love about evidence-based medicine, because evidence-based medicine, more often than not, tells us to be careful. So if the medics say, oh, I have a solution, and then somebody goes and does a systematic review of the literature, and then they find, oh, you thought you had a solution, but it's a bit messier than that. So the key concepts that I want to introduce you to you uh, rely on these categories. So if the test detects a disease and the person has a disease, this is the true positive, if the test detects no disease, but a person has a disease, this is a, whoops, wrong way around, false negative. If the test detects a disease and the person does not have a disease, this is a false positive. And if the test detects no disease and the patient does not have a disease, this is a true negative. So 
These two need to be transposed, guys, and I'll upload a corrected version on my slideshow. So, the useful concepts here is that we have sensitivity, which is the number of true positives divided by the people with the disease, specificity, which is the true negatives per people without the disease, and the positive predictive value, which is the true positives among all the positives detected by the test. I've yet to come across a single test that can be administered that has one on all of those measures, right? So there's always a concern, there's always an uncertainty. And all these uncertainties come with cost and with an acceptability. So very often what we're doing is a trade-off. And what evidence-based medicine does is it helps us synthesize uh, lots of data and critique the body of data and the studies that yield those numbers. Because, you know, a lot of the time, those studies come from white people who are well enough to enroll, in, to enroll into trials, who have no fancy comorbidities, any other stuff going on that could screw the stats. Um, and the experience of uh, people who are non-white, non-Caucasian, is not studied in depth. Very different. So let's look at the true positive. Congratulations, you have dementia. Oh, your depression is back. Thought you'd want to know. So, you know, what does this do to people and how do they live with it? I'll never forget uh, when I was doing some focus group works, uh, focus group work with people with dementia, a woman said to me, you know, when I was diagnosed, the uh, geriatric physician just said, oh, you have dementia, here are a few leaflets, goodbye. And she'd been looking after her partner with dementia for years. So she knew exactly what she was up for. And it was a shock that she hadn't processed. So how do you break the news? And if you look at the literature, uh, you'll find that it's a judgment call because you need to time it. You need to make sure that you know how to break the diagnosis, to whom. Do you break it first to the caregiver if the dementia is relatively well advanced? And also whether to break the news at all. Because if somebody no longer has the capacity to understand what's going on with them, do, do we break the news or do we not? So these are all things that need to be kept in mind. And also people react in a variety of ways. People have very different ways of coping with bad news in the first place, coping with bad health news in the second place. So what we really need is a very individualized approach. And then we also need post-diagnostic support, which is where uh, special dementia often falls flat. And these are the complexities that we need to deal with. And you know, a simple app that maps somebody's speech patterns, somebody's uh, language patterns onto risk of cognitive impairment, um, that's too simplistic. You know, where are we in that context? Another issue is with relapse and exacerbation. Now that's something that hits close to home for me because I live with chronic depression and I have exacerbations, um, I have relapses every once in a while. And um, I know from myself, and I'm talking about myself because as I go through the literature, I find that, you know, there are actually quite a few people just like me, um, that, you know, every time you have a relapse, in the first couple of years, you go, I thought I, you know, I thought I'd gotten well again. I thought I could function again, like before. No, no thank you. So you have really have to adjust how you manage your life. But the key to this adjustment is adjusting to living with an illness and not living the illness. So a lot of the discourse in health, as I don't know who was um, in the talk that Isabel Peterson gave about why uh, body area networks. A lot of the, a lot of that idea of, you know, instrumenting yourself, having your smartphone look after you is that, you know, the onus is on you to be constantly monitored and watched so that we can make sure that you're alerted every time you're going mental again. But that means that you live the illness. 
does that help you live with the illness? You still need to do your everyday work. You still need to manage your illness. You need to take your pills and you need to assemble this change into your own identity. So you repeatedly, if you live with a chronic illness, you need to adjust your identity goals. And a lot of that is, um, you know, quite different from what uh, healthcare tells you. So I've been doing some evaluation work of, for telehealth for the National Health Service in the Scottish Highlands and Islands, which is a very, um, which is a very remote area on a much smaller scale than British Columbia, but also with mountains and seas and difficulties getting from A to B. And um, many of the people said, you know, I've got chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, but I keep smoking because I've got so much going on in my life. My daughter has severe epilepsy. I can no longer do all of the things I wanted to do. I keep my cigarettes, okay? So for the design of actuality solutions, this means that we need to think hard about the purpose that it serves to tell people that they're getting worse. Because I know that some people want to have prior warnings, say people with bipolar, whether they're getting manic, or whether they're going into a depressive episode so that they can prepare, then how is the news timed? And also, how can we integrate that with solutions for managing one's life, you know, for living with the illness instead of living the illness? And then we've got the false positive. Positive, and that ties in very nicely with the idea of uh, cancer, what we've talked about before. Congratulations, you need to do a biopsy. We found a lump. Now, there's a lot of discourse around breast cancer screening that says, you know, you have to go to your screening because if they find something, they can intervene early. So the ideal is that the benefits of early detection outweigh any harm. You know, we're not doing harm. But the thing is that these screening programs often produce many false positives. Likewise, there's also now the case of false positives in dementia, because what they've mm -hmm. gone and done is they've, uh, they've tried to um, find precursors to dementia. So there's this whole category of minor cognitive impairment, which basically means that you score below two standard deviations on a cognitive test, right? So you have a slightly abnormal score, but obviously the more scores you do, the more likely it is that one of those scores will come out abnormal, right? So the trouble is that um, <coughs> actually, and again, that's where evidence-based medicine comes to the rescue, strong evidence for the benefits of screening are really hard to establish because very <laughs> often what you get is, oh, people who are screened live longer. Yes, that's because the illness was detected earlier, and we don't know whether that would have actually, you know, if, say, somebody lived five years after breast cancer diagnosis, and the cancer was detected through screening, if that cancer had taken its normal course and become symptomatic, it might have been detected three years into the illness, but the person would still have died two years hence. So. And then also, false positives, and that's another very interesting line of evidence, mean that people actually seek help later when they finally develop the disease. And they're also far less likely to keep up screening. Because it, it's either, ah, you've worried unnecessarily, and you, know, you go to your doctor and say, oh, I found this lump, and the doctor says, oh, you're just worried, and especially with women, especially with women, you know, when women come to the doctor and say, oh, I'm worried about my health, ach, you're making it up. And there's also considerable distress caused by the positive screen itself, which is very hard to distinguish for the patient from an actual diagnosis, because very often when the mammogram comes back and there's a breast biopsy, it feels like you've been diagnosed with cancer. So then the questions for data-driven diagnosis, uh, pulling both case studies together arises, you know, who's being diagnosed? What are their identity goals and what are their coping strategies? You know, 
will somebody who's already being treated for diabetes and heart failure care that they've got asthma in, into the bargain? Probably not. What is the evidence that this information is beneficial for the patient? That's a big, um, that's a big question for dementia because although drugs, col col uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, have been produced that can slow the disease down a little if it's caught early, um, that's not that much of a benefit. So, you know, why are we? Why are we giving people the diagnosis? Are we giving them the, the diagnosis so that they can prepare? What are we telling them? Are we telling them that, you know, look, once your dementia is progressing, you can actually have a really good um, quality of life because, you know, once you're ill enough, you're, you know, you've forgotten that you've got dementia and you might feel okay again. And also, how do we communicate the uncertainty associated with diagnosis? One of the things I will never forget is when I was first introduced to neurodegenerative diseases and it, I heard that Alzheimer's can only be diagnosed by autopsy. Up until autopsy, Alzheimer's, an Alzheimer's diagnosis is always probable, never certain, because they need to see the plaques in your brain. And also what support is there in place for them and their families? So I want to conclude with three conclusions. First, do no harm. Second, consider the person that you're talking to and their context. And then third, consider the actual evidence. And we haven't even followed the power trails, the money trails to Big Pharma, etc. Okay, any questions I'll leave for the actual panel. Thank you.